listen, I, uh, I think the time has come for me to retire. I look around YouTube, everybody's so young, I'm getting old. I think you need to take over for me. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just do it myself. Hello, friends. Welcome back to the show. So glad to see you all once again. And thank you for joining us for the first episode of reviewing Batman Beyond right here on this channel. If you're new here, I encourage you to hop below and hit the subscribe button because I am just getting started reviewing each and every episode of Batman Beyond looking at it through the lens of being an adult now, having grown up on a lot of the Batman DC animated world shows, but looking at this show now, gosh, it's been over 20 years. So if you haven't got a chance, please hit the subscribe button. And you know what, if you're new, why don't you hop over and see some of the other videos that we have here on the channel. I've reviewed all of the Batman, the original animated series, all the Superman, the new adventures of Batman, right here, just for you. But today I'm particularly excited to jump into Batman Beyond. Now this series is one that I got a lot of requests from all of you to be reviewing here on the channel after doing Batman the Animated Series and Superman and uh, Batman the New Adventures of... The new Batman Adventures? Or whatever it's called. Uh, reviewing those, everybody wanted to see me do Batman Beyond and I was a little hesitant at first because I don't have the history with Batman Beyond that I know a lot of other people do. I was in high school by the time this came out and was involved with a lot of other things and didn't really dig into the show as much, but I've heard a lot of great things later about how much people enjoyed it. And so I'm looking forward to going back and watching through the series and giving you some of my thoughts along the way. And today we're talking about the premiere episode, the two-parter, Rebirth, Part 1 and 2, which originally aired on January 10th, 1999. Hey hour, kids, you're on TV. It's still crazy to me to think of 1999, which doesn't seem that long ago, just coming into the turn of the, the century and the year 2000. But honestly, it is 20 years ago. Uh, 1999, 21 years ago. And it's just, it's crazy to think. And look at a show like this that came out. It seems like it came out so long ago, and yet it was. Now, as a diehard fan of the original Batman the Animated Series, I am of two minds going into this series. That one is I am excited for the continuation to see the story evolve from uh, the Batman uh, mythos. But at the same time, as a purist of the Bruce Wayne Batman, I, I hope that this holds up the way that it should. But we'll get into all that right after our 90 second Beyond Bomb countdown as I give you a synopsis of the entire two-part episode of Rebirth see if I remember how to do this. We start out with an older Batman with a new suit fighting some crime to, to uh, at a hangar to uh, uh, rescue Reeling's daughter, I believe it is, and he kind of gets beat up and he takes his mask off, goes back home, and he's like, ah, never again, this is this is it, and he shuts down the Batcave. Now we look at 20 years on top of that later, I think it's 2039, and we're, we now see uh, a Terry McGinnis on the subway and uh, dry, riding somewhere, and a gang of jokers come out, and he starts uh, uh, beating them up and protecting uh, uh, some of the other people on the train, and and then that leads to him at school and also gets in a fight with a bully and goes home and his dad, who's who works for Wayne Powers, uh, is getting a disturbing message from a, a, a colleague of his and Terry comes in and he goes, oh, you're grounded. And he goes, I don't want to be grounded. And he leaves anyway and he goes and meets up at this club with his girlfriend and it's there that he meets up with the Joker gang again, which takes him back to, uh, in this high speed chase, back to Wayne Manor and he, and he helps Bruce after Bruce helps him and he goes into the house and Bruce falls asleep or passes out one or the other and he sees this bat in the clock tower and he goes, down and he sees the Batcave and he discovers who Batman is. He goes, oh, that's, that's really odd. I better call my dad. And he calls his dad and he, he heads back home. And then we uh, uh, later are, um, uh, he, he, he gets a diss from his dad. Oh, wow. And then he comes back and his dad has been killed by somebody uh, for what he knows about the uh, uh, the potion, the potion, the, uh, uh, the, the, the gas that he's been working with his colleague on. And so now Terry's very sad and his dad's dead. Part two, it starts off and Terry is, has, uh, is, is contacted by Derek Powers, who knows the... 
that was there was no way I was going to get that. I got through the first part. I got to get warmed up. It's been a while since I've done this. So we uh, Terry meets up with Derek Powers and he goes, "Oh, you have this disc that your dad had, and I need to have that." So he gets the disc and and but but first he goes to Batman and he says, "Hey, I need your help, Bruce Wayne, and I need your help to uh, to to take this down." He looks at the disc. He goes, "Oh, you got to turn this over to Barbara Gordon, Commissioner Barbara Gordon, Gordon, and she'll take care of all this." And then we go to and he goes, "I don't want to do that." Then he meets up with Derek and uh, then he goes back to the Batcave and steals the bat suit and takes off. Bruce Wayne is talking to him while he's. Uh, uh, in the bat suit, and he goes, "Oh, this is this is now. You shouldn't do this. I want you to bring it back." He goes to Wayne. He, he sees that uh, they're at the uh, uh, they're working on this nerve gas thing, and he overhears them saying that they were the ones that killed Terry McGinnis, uh, uh, not Terry McGinnis, uh, Mc, Terry McGinnis's dad. And so he does that, and he breaks in and he starts fighting. Bruce shuts down in the suit, and he goes, "Oh, I need your help," and he and f- fires back up, and he fights, and he goes back. And then the next morning, he wakes up, and Bruce is there talking to his mom, and he goes, "Oh, I think I'm." Gonna offer him a job and hence we now have the formation of Bruce and Terry as a team and then we go forward in time uh, and we see Derek uh, Powers is now green glowing from the uh, uh, nerve gas that he used I gave myself time off for good behavior I think and I could be wrong this might be the first or only time that they use kind of a prologue sequence before even the title sequence in the episode to kind of bridge the gap from the future to uh, the series that we left off in or the timeline that we left off in. And we see Bruce is a little bit older and is even his fighting style is a little different. He has a new suit, which makes sense because he would have evolved it, the tech that he has um, but certainly is not the crime fighter that he once was, and he recognizes this and decides to shut down the operation. And 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 I think too, it's it's kind of a neat moment to call back to when he he's he's down and is having trouble fighting these guys that he pulls out a gun or grabs their gun and pulls it on him, and that being kind of the catalyst to go. Boy, maybe it's time to hang up the cape. I think that 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 little sequence there, one they do a great job of of explaining a lot just in that voiceover of the newscast. Once again, billionaire Bruce Wayne has averted an attempted takeover of his company by Derek Powers of Powers Technology. It felt like a deliberate story rather than just starting in the future and going, "Oh yeah, here's this kid and he teams up with Batman and becomes a new Batman." They kind of I really liked that 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 setup, that prologue, because, like I said, it bridges that gap and shows it doesn't just take us from, you know, Batman and his prime to old Batman. It, it kind of shows that middle ground of what it was that makes him hang up the cowl and and sets up a great relationship between him and Terry because Terry is obviously a very different person, a different crime fighter, and we kind of see those differences of Batman seeing what he could have become and what he is uh, doesn't want to be. Give this to Commissioner Barbara Gordon. Tell her I sent you. The cops? Which I think I need to, to establish now that I'm going to call Bruce Wayne, Bruce, and Terry, Terry, or Batman, that when I re- reference Batman, I think Bruce, but Terry is Batman now. Bruce is the old Batman. Make that separation right now. You're Batman. I was Batman. But it was also a great sequence because for me, as a as a long-term Batman, Bruce Wayne fan, to that it's kind of sad seeing him shut down the cave and seeing him shut down operation of what he's worked so hard to build and finally coming to that moment where it's time to retire. And I know some episodes in the old Batman series kind of dealt with that of like, maybe it's time to give up. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this anymore. Maybe I should retire. And obviously it never happened because it's his show. But this one, they can finally fulfill that prophecy that at some point he was going to have to give up the crime fighting business and move on to something else and he does it in this episode never again 
And then, of course, it goes into the title sequence, which uh, is was very clear that really does set the tone of this being a very different show. The um, electric guitar music and kind of the, the jazzy kind of animation and and um, I, I call it kind of the MTV editing style of like the uh, uh, distortion effects and, and, and video effects that are going on there. I can tell that it's a very deliberate uh, shift to gear it more towards a younger audience and more hip rock and roll kind of Gen Xers or I guess millennial crowd uh, truly the millennial and and again you know it's not my personal style that uh, I, I you know what I liked about the old show was that film noir kind of art deco detective kind of style this being more of a rock and roll sort of hip thing but again I'm going to try not to make comparisons but just in terms of the opening sequence they set the tone of it being a very different show, which just on the idea of that is good because, again, they're very separate shows and, and it's a very separate story. It's a very separate kind of uh, style, just as different as Batman the Animated Series and Superman the Animated Series and even the new adventures of Batman, as different as those are. Uh, this is the the next iteration of that. It's in the future. It's a different Batman. It's a different style, different stories. And, and they establish that well in that title sequence. This thing might be old, but it's still cutting edge. I do have to say I was a little confused when I thought about this show is that I thought it took place 20 years later, but that's not necessarily true. I, I think the idea is the prologue is... 20 years from the current date, so 1999, I think it, that was supposed to be placed at 2019, theoretically. And then the rest of the show takes place 20 years after that, so it'd be like 2039. I think I understand that correctly now, but I was confused because when I was initially watching this that I was going, it seems pretty far advanced and Bruce seems pretty old for it to only be 20 years later. I think by the time we meet Terry as a teenager, Batman's now been retired for 20 years, which I think is a neat plot point that Terry never lived in a world where Batman existed. So sure, he's heard stories, sure, he's he's been aware of this, this kind of uh, hero that was over Gotham City, but never knew what it was like to have Batman in the world. Jeez, no wonder he could fight. Now, speaking of Terry McGinnis, the new persona for Batman is, I know a lot of people talk very highly of Terry McGinnis, and I, I'm, I'm uh, just learning more about him as I watch through these shows. And, and again, he, he's a different uh, uh, Batman, and I, and I think that that was the initial pitch for this show was what would it be like to have a teenage Batman? And rather than just going uh, Batman Jr. and and having him exist in a, uh, you know, what would it be like if Batman became Batman when he was just a teenager or the early years of Batman? It's kind of the opposite approach. It's now the much later Batman and they introduce a younger uh, another character who has no connection to Bruce Wayne in any way other than this happenstance that he meets up with him. Man, you're something. But has a kind of a similar story. He has, his dad is killed, uh, which kind of forces him into this line of work. Not for the same reasons that Bruce Wayne was, but really for revenge. Uh, he just wants to get even and get the guys that did this to him. So his motivation is interesting. And he also doesn't really have any any formal training. He, he more so relies on this, on the tech of the suit, which again is a very different style from what we've seen from Batman. Batman being a character that has no superpowers and just relies on his wits and his, and his talent and his abilities, where now we have Terry McGinnis, who is very much relying on the tech and the suit to do a lot of the heavy lifting, as it were, uh, for him. So, I like that, and I like that, again, it's not just uh, some of the trends of the other cartoons. I remember there was a James Bond Jr. show or, or Young Indiana Jones, all those kinds of things that are just, just it's the same idea or concept of that, but, but told in a, a justified way. Get out! As much as the story is just sort of happenstance that Terry happened to be in the right place at the right time to learn and, and easily stumbled upon that Batman, Bruce Wayne, was Batman, 
seemed a little convenient for storytelling purposes, but it uh, it makes sense and, and in this world works for what they're doing. And they didn't labor it out. This is a two-parter, but they didn't labor that point on too much. It was just they got into uh, this had to be an origin story to set it up to, to let people know that it's different, but they uh, quickly were able to set those elements up and then get the story moving forward. You're no Batman, you whacked out old fraud. I like the design of this show. Once again, it, it's sort of a new design. Um, the animation style is very similar to uh, Superman or that, that kind of clean lines of the new ad Batman adventures. But it's uh, but this Gotham City is a very different style. Would have been easy to kind of take Gotham from the original series and just make it futuristic more like what metropolis is but it's sort of a, a even a, a different take on the futuristic look of metropolis and and to me it sort of has that kind of production design element that we saw a lot in the 80s movies that kind of depicted the future kind of that robocop sort of dystopian a little bit uh kind of uh, grungy look into the future uh, with high-tech elements mixed with some retro elements that we uh, have come to love. And some of that may just be because they didn't couldn't predict the future of what technology would still be there and what wouldn't. It looks like what Gotham would look like in the future versus uh, in Superman, they have the Metropolis, which is a very kind of idealistic world of tomorrow kind of look and everything's very clean and sharp and brand new and fresh. Uh, this looks futuristic, without looking too overly high tech. Yeah, there's hover cars and there's jetpacks and things like that, but there is a a, um, a good focus on, on, like I said, that kind of grungier, um, still Gotham is, a, is kind of a rough around the edges kind of city, and I like that. I knew McGinnis was a freak job. Oh no! And even in the sound design, they took a different approach with this and, again, appealing to the younger audience, but also updating it and keeping it a little hipper with the uh, kind of guitar riffs as the segue music. It's a very clear design choice, and I appreciate that. Again, even if it's not my personal style, it does kind of help draw you into this world as to what you're seeing and kind of it all works in sync with each other to make it... Um, a cohesive design. And that I appreciate, even if it's not my personal style. And then we also have the introduction of the Joker gang, which I happen to know does make a couple appearances here and there, which, um, again, it, it's, it's a nice way of paying homage to the past characters and villains of the show and now expanding on them and not just, oh, it's Joker's son, but now it's a whole gang that's kind of influenced by the Joker. And I know that's a theme that kind of recurs throughout different iterations of the Joker. Even the newest Joker movie kind of plays with that without uh, giving away any spoilers if you haven't seen that movie, which by the way, you should. It's excellent just as a movie in itself, but also kind of the way it ties into the Batman story. But that's for another video. So if you'd like me to do a full review on the Joker movie, leave me a comment below. I saw you smile. So they kind of play with that idea of Joker inspiring this gang. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing if they build on that more in the future. But as I was watching this episode, the voice of the leader of the gang. Evening, boys and girls. Who's up for some laughs? I was like, boy, that voice sounds really familiar. And I couldn't quite place it. But I did recognize that it has kind of the same inflection that Mark Hamill did, which I thought, well, that makes a lot of sense that, that if this guy is inspired by the original Joker, that, that he would have that. And it wasn't until I looked it up that I realized it was Bruce Tim. Bruce Tim, the producer and creator of the original series and this show, uh, voiced that character himself. So I did a little more digging and, and the story that I saw was that the um, they did have somebody else cast in this role and Bruce Tim just wasn't happy with the performance and he kind of tried to give an example of how it should sound and they ended up wanting to use Bruce Tim's take on it anyway and so he ends up voicing this character throughout the show which I thought was kind of neat and and uh, uh, I, I like seeing him make his appearances in there as he did as the uh, toy collector uh, toy, not Toy Man, I think it's a toy collector in the uh, Grey Ghost episode of Batman, which you can check out over here. Who do you think you're talking to, old man? So that was a nice little cameo from Bruce Tim. 
And also, another cameo, maybe not a cameo, maybe it uh, recurs more, but we see Ace the Bat Hound. <laughs> Down, Ace. He's okay. And I think just to get a little in-depth into this, is that we, you know, seeing Bruce Wayne as an older man is um, some of the highlights of the show, which, you know, he's a supporting character in the show, obviously, and, and is still influenced uh, what's going on in the stories. But it's neat to kind of, as as we go through the episodes, it's seeing more and more and peeling back more and more of Bruce Wayne as a character and his and continuing his arc on from the original series. And what's neat about that is Batman, or Bruce Wayne, who is, that's going to take time to get used to, uh, Bruce Wayne, who has always been a, a, a loner and, and keeps to himself and brooding and, and doesn't share his life with other people, always has another companion. You know, I mean, uh, uh, Alfred, his longtime butler, who obviously is, has uh, presumably passed away at this point, um, was always his confidant and somebody else in, in, in his house. And you would think that once Alfred a, a, a has passed away, that, that Bruce would be fine with just locking himself up in his, his mansion by himself. But yet he gets a dog and he has a dog as a companion now and is quick to take on Terry as his protege, as his uh, um, successor, if you will. And so it always seems like there's always somebody that he is connected to. So as much as he claims to be a loner and wants to be a loner, he does have that need for other people in his life. And, and I think that that's illustrated well, whether it was deliberate or not, by uh, introducing Ace as his companion in this big mansion to himself. Nice dog. Not really. And then we get into part two, and we introduce Commissioner Barbara Gordon, which I thought was, again, a nice continuation of the of the past story that Barbara was Batgirl, and, and presumably there was something that got her out of the crime-fighting business, and maybe it, it was age as well, is now followed in her father's footsteps. After all of that, follows in her father's footsteps to uh, succeed him as commissioner of the police force. So... I like seeing her introduced, and I, and, and I know that she also makes appearances throughout the episodes as a supporting character as well. Give this to Commissioner Barbara Gordon. Tell her I sent you. The cops? And it's interesting looking at some of the tech that exists in the show, and, and obviously from the perspective of 1999, now just 20 years later, uh, where we are now in reality versus the show taking place even 20 years beyond where we are now, to see some of the tech and some of the predictions. And I always like watching old um, sci-fi movies and things like that, or um, uh, movies that are made a while ago, and then looking at the future and seeing what exists and what doesn't exist. The tech comparison of this episode is that they still are using discs, which for us, I think, went out a long time ago. Uh, couldn't have been that long after 1999 that we even went to CDs, but even beyond that, that those quickly kind of dissolved away as a way of storing information and went to flash drives. And now everything's in the cloud. And that seemed like a natural evolution, but they just kind of missed it in 1999. Give me back my disc. What disc? And now we finally get to see in the second part of this two-parter, uh, Terry stealing the bat suit and taking off. And it was amazing to me to see that this guy, this kid, saves, steals the bat suit and immediately starts flying. Which again, maybe the suit is very in intuitive and easy to use, but I feel like if it was me and I took the suit, I'd be a little apprehensive to start with flight versus, oh, maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll just uh, take my time with this before I jump off a building and hope I can fly. The suit works even better than I thought it would. But having said that, I do appreciate one of the tropes that, that always kind of um, bothers me in some of these origin stories is, uh, especially hero origin stories, is that that clunky first mission out and oh, it's so hard to learn how to do this and, and, and then all of a sudden they're great at it. And this, because of the suit, kind of takes some of that away. And he kind of really, Terry jumps in and hits the ground running. So he's immediately able to do what he needs to do. And then the conflict or the, the struggle is created by Bruce Wayne now being 
controlling this in the background is able to just shut it down and and kind of assert the dominance of of hey I can I'm still in charge here and you need to listen to me which I thought was great to to kind of establish all of those elements so that first mission out was uh it was fun to see and it was fun to see uh, uh Terry again jumping into and not wasting a lot of time trying to explain oh I got to do this and if I run and oh I got to jump and all those kind of discovering your powers kind of trope that they do in a lot of superhero uh, shows or stories. In case the wrong person gets into it. But you can't. I just did. Which also gives another opportunity to set up a little bit of a, um, a dynamic between Bruce and him that we see Bruce is, is very much, uh, he's gotten uh, a little hardened even more in his old age and is a little cruel. I mean, he literally shuts down the suit, turns his back, and... It sits there and listens to Terry getting getting beat up and, and shocked and tased and all this other stuff and and you know is finally calling out that he says they're they're gonna kill me and uh, I think it's Ace that kind of looks up at Bruce that makes him go okay fine I'll, I'll reactivate the suit which I thought wow wow uh, Bruce has has gotten cruel in his old age a little hardened but but it's a nice dynamic that I think we're gonna see more of is that relationship of Terry just running in and not thinking first like teenagers do. No, just gung-ho and, and wants to get in there and, and avenge his father. Um, and Bruce being a little bit more methodical about it, a little bit thought. So those kind of polar dynamic, polar opposites of the characters, you know, that compromise in the middle is where we're gonna see a different kind of an action show now i'm a sitting duck hope you're happy so in to encapsulate these this episode yeah it's an origin story and I, i'm normally a little bit um not apprehensive but but those typically aren't aren't some of my favorite episodes but it was important for this it wasn't like um <laughs> telling the origin of spider-man in the movies for the 18th time in a five-year period I'm exaggerating, but you get the point that it's like, I think at this point, we generally have an idea of who Spider-Man is. We don't need to have that origin story told once again. We don't need to see Superman come from Krypton once again, but this is a new story and this is an original story and it's taking what we know about Batman and, and, and they were tasked with, okay, we got to introduce this new character. We got to fast forward the show 40 years or whatever it ends up being into the future and set that up. And I think they did that really well. And I think they told the story that needed to be told, gave us the information that they needed to give, left enough to be determined or, or for us to figure out as the story goes. And, and set up the dynamics of the new characters and this new world and the new Batman. And yet they still had a good core story and, and they didn't prolong it too much. A two-parter was plenty to tell this much story. And we really don't get to see the new Batman until the second episode. So the first episode felt like, uh, you know, kind of that backstory of what's going on and setting up a lot of things. And uh, this second part felt like, Okay, here's the story and here's the kind of story that we're going to see with Batman. And again, it's nice to see that they gave a motivation and a reason for Terry to exist and for him to need Bruce as much as Bruce needs him. And so that's kind of a neat relationship that they developed there without just being a copycat of regurgitating that same story that happened to Batman. I know how you lost your folks. The guy who murdered my dad is on that transport. This is my one chance to nail him. And of course, at the end, we uh, also have the uh, the inevitable setting up a future villain, a future adversary for Batman Beyond with Derek Powers becoming Blight. I think his name's Blight, which I think they're setting up to be the Lex Luthor of, of, of Superman or the Joker to Batman, that this is being the primary villain. And uh, and I also I kind of like that dynamic where Terry was part of creating this super villain um, with the nerve gas and his part that he played in that. So that'll be interesting to see where it rolls out, as if all of you don't know yet. Uh, but it's still kind of new to me. <laughs> 
So when it comes time to rank this episode, obviously this is the first episode in the series, so it's uh, not hard to say that for all those reasons, I'm going to rank that at number one of my favorite episodes so far. But I do think that it's going to hang up in there in the in the top tier, top ten or so, or top five for a little while anyway, because it is a solid uh, show. And again, kind of looking at it through fresh eyes, I like where this series is going. It's not the old Batman, and I and I have to keep telling myself that it's a very different series, and it's not fair to compare it. And I know some people uh, will naturally compare it and go, "Oh, the, I like this series better than the original," or 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 what? And it, and it's a generational thing. If you were born in the '90s and this was your coming of age Batman story, I could see the old Batman series being feeling old and dated to you, which I think is the motivation of of them making this show. But um, but I like it. I, I, I'm excited to see more of these episodes and I, I think that this is a, that I'm confident putting this at the number one spot and not just by default because it's the only one I reviewed so far, but we'll see where it goes from here. What's the bad news? So let me know, were you a fan of Batman Beyond when it originally aired, or are you a new fan or discovered it later, or are you a, uh, grew up with this show but still like the old Batman show? Let me know in the comment section below. So as a new fan of Batman Beyond, I, I'm excited to jump into the next episode and see where this series goes. I admittingly was a little nervous watching the first episode going, boy, I hope I like this because I made a commitment that I'm going to review all the episodes, and I hope that I do in fact enjoy watching these and I really do as different as it is from the original series it's a brand new show to me and it's a new uh you know it's done in a very different style and I'm excited to see kind of a different take on on Batman and like I said I'm going to be reviewing these episodes every Tuesday and Thursday so be sure to stop back and check those out if you haven't already hit that subscribe button and the bell notification if you want to be notified when the new episodes come out and next up I'm going to be reviewing the episode Blackout so you don't want to miss that. As always, thank you so much for watching. I'm Andy Canode, and I'll see you soon.